Um, thanks so much for, for coming along to, to this session. Uh, my name's Phil Nash. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. Um, can I ask just to start with, like, who here has heard of Twilio at all before? All right, quite a few. That's cool. Uh, and for those of you who haven't, um, Twilio is a, a communications API. So it's an API that you can use in, in your applications to connect or communicate with your users via voice, video, messaging, uh, and all sorts of other stuff, uh, including uh, my favorite one, uh, Fax. <laughs> Not a well. The only joke there is it's not my favourite, obviously, but we can do it via fax. So um, we are uh, we are hanging around in the sponsor area upstairs as well. So uh, there's myself, and my my colleague Devin. Come say hi, uh, and uh, and come grab stickers and, and things like that. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about Twilio, of course. Uh, I'm actually here to talk about my favourite uh, web uh, uh, API these days, which is the Service Worker. Um, service Workers uh, are, are an amazing thing that have been around for about three years in browsers now, uh, although only just this year in some of them. Uh, allowing us to provide offline experiences for, for users of our, of our web applications. Um, service worker support is an important thing. Um, whenever you talk about new browser APIs, it's always interesting to know who does support it. And as I said, we've been around for a while, and uh, I'm very happy that this year, not only Chrome and Opera and Firefox have it, but both Safari and Edge released support for it this year. So all the major browsers support the Service Worker API now in at least their latest uh, efforts. And that to me is just super exciting because it removes all of those uh, uh, excuses for anybody that doesn't want to uh, implement this kind of thing um, because, there's, because Edge doesn't have it or something like that. It's now available everywhere. Uh, and and um, if you'd already built something with a Service Worker uh, as a progressive enhancement, then uh, users of Safari and Edge are now having a better experience as well. Uh, and that's why I'm excited about it. I, I have this wonderful explosion GIF of service workers because that's how I feel every time I see something work uh, with a service worker. If I hit something and it's got offline and, I, and it works, it's there. But that's kind of it. Like A lot of the service worker stuff and a lot of the uh, new things um, that people have done with it is basically around caching. Uh, we're there to um, intercept network requests because that's what the service worker can do. It sits in the background of web pages. Doesn't, the web page doesn't have to even be loaded in the browser. The service worker is there and can intercept those network requests and return either things from a cache, create uh, responses on its own, um, or basically just get rid of this guy. Um, and the <laughs> Nobody has ever gone to a website so that they can play the dinosaur game. Or dinosaur, I believe it's the internet's down a saw. Um, no one has ever gone there just to play this game, uh, except I did once. I was on a particularly long uh, train ride in Poland and didn't have any network connection. I knew I was going to see anything else. I was like, well, I could try and get a high score on the dinosaur game, um, which about offline uh, will actually take you there as well without you having to try and load a website and get this instead. But nobody's ever really gone for this. Um, so being able to return uh, a cached response or create an offline response to users uh, is a really useful thing. but. Uh, and, and it brings us better resiliency, um, you know, in the case of, of poor network connections or zero network connection, the website works more resiliently, right? It's still going to return an experience that the users kind of expected to see. And there's varying ways you can deal with this, uh, but um, it's going to be it's more resilient. You can keep your brand on that offline page uh, rather than the dinosaur and rather than Chrome's brand. But it also can be better performance. In the cases of decent uh, network connections or poor network connections, if you've already cached a bunch of things offline, uh, then they can load almost instantly, uh, waiting for anything that has maybe not, uh, not been cached before. But that's just gonna, that's gonna bring things to user screen on repeat uh, views um, much quicker over and over. And ultimately, it brings better experiences for users. And this is kind of what I'm here to talk about today because I've uh, the, the caching kind of stuff is, is the bread and butter service worker. Uh, and I want to talk a bit more about the other features that service workers bring to us now that they're sitting in the background waiting for us to, um, to use them. And those better experiences can be brought out of uh, two of the functions. Uh, so, right, this is why I called the talk Beyond the Cache. We're not just talking about the cache anymore, but about what else we can do with a service worker. And those two things that we can do today, I think, are push notifications and background sync. Uh, and I'm going to cover, uh, hopefully in depth, a bit about e both of them. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we go away with an understanding of how to use these best to improve our, improve our experiences 
um, and make better web applications for our users. So push notifications, let's start with that. Who's a fan of push notifications? Actually quite a few people. Some people are like, no, kill them. They sh no, they should never exist. Um, and that's fair, like there are some really annoying ones. I have never once wanted to receive a push notification from the Apple News app on my iOS device uh, telling me about any breaking news, uh, mainly because it tends to pick like celebrity stories for me. And that's, I don't even know how that's breaking news. <laughs> like I was aware the royal wedding was going to happen. You didn't need to tell me seven times as it did. But well, let's talk about good push notifications and things we can use this for. I'll start with support because that's always important to browsers. Uh, and it's actually pretty good. Uh, it's supported in Chrome and Firefox and Opera, um, not Safari, but Edge. Uh, it, I was really delighted that it, that it came out with Edge in their first release of uh, service workers came with push notifications as well. Uh, and, uh, and I was so excited at the time that I was building a little demo and I, I instantly downloaded a VM uh, and spun up VMware to test it working. And, uh, and this was uh, me testing it in Edge, having not changed anything, from my, my kind of Chrome demo, and it just straight up worked. Uh, and then I closed the VM and stopped looking at it again. <laughs> so I have a Mac, it's fine. <laughs> but it worked, like, and I was pretty excited about that. Um, Safari, on the other hand, uh, they did implement uh, a push notification style thing in Safari for the desktop, um, which uses kind of the existing iOS, uh, like APNS, push notification service. Um, but that doesn't work on iOS devices and it's entirely non-standard, uh, so I like to ignore it. Uh, if you really need Safari desktop push notification support, you can build it for yourself. But I'm not gonna go into it, it's not service worker based. Um, but with that uh, amount of uh, browser support, if you look at caniuse.com and their kind of global statistics, uh, and I, you can import your own uh, user data into this to see what it looks like for your users, but globally, uh, using their generic stuff, uh, it's almost three quarters of users can receive push notifications on their devices or their laptops. And so this is definitely not a feature we should be ignoring um, because of, of because Safari is not involved. Um, so push notifications, I think, are incredibly useful. Uh, as I said, there are definitely the ones that don't, uh, are definitely not useful and, and almost put you off having a, a, a phone in your pocket all the time. Um, but things that I just, I think a good notifications fall into a bunch of categories, and I have a few examples uh, here today. Um, first up, appointment reminders, um, I think are really important, and, and this is not the, the most exciting of examples, but the, the kind of impact that an appointment reminder can have um, depends on your on use case. And uh, actually, so there's a, there's a Twilio customer, um, the Arkansas Children's Hospital in the US, uh, and they found that um, they had appointment dropout rates of 20%. Uh, that's children going to hospitals to see doctors, 20% not turning up. And so that's a fifth of the time of these doctors not doing the thing they were intending to do. Uh, and they implemented appointment reminders using SMS, as I said, the Toyo client, um, uh, a Toyo customer, sorry. Um, but in doing so, uh, dropped that uh, from 20% to 2% dropout. Um, so if you are building something in which people are booking online for something, you could be doing this uh, via, um, uh, you could be reminding people via, via their browser, via push notification this way. Um, other things, chat is a, is a fairly obvious example when it comes to push notifications and probably one of the things that maybe annoys us most about it as well. Um, I'll get into why those alerts might, uh, might put you off. Um, ETA alerts, this is uh, for kind of time of arrival things. This is really useful for deliveries uh, if you're, you know, if something's to be delivered today, um, or indeed uh, if you're using one of the kind of more modern uh, maybe food delivery apps, like your food is arriving in two minutes, uh, get some knives and forks out. Um, or, uh, you know, similarly for if you booked a car or a taxi, uh, it's outside your door right now. Uh, that's a great push notification because it, it because it's important to you right now. Uh, another event updates. Uh, I was almost late turning up here. It would have been great if I'd had a notification. <laughs> But that's my own fault. Um, uh, if we had, if you could though, uh, go through the um, the website or the app. I haven't actually downloaded the app. I don't know if you can pick favorite uh, talks on there and get notifications when they're about to start. That's what I'd like out of it. Um, but I think of other things, other events and one-offs that I, I want to receive these kind of things for, such as I, I live in Melbourne right now and, and being uh, notified that my flight is uh, open for check-in or if it was delayed, then being notified of that. All really important kind of things around an event. Um, these notifications all kind of share 
three kind of things um, about them about them that make them useful uh, notifications, in my opinion, and that they are timely, actionable, and personal. Uh, timely uh, is important. It doesn't matter. It, it's particularly useless if you get your appointment reminder the day after the appointment instead of, say, the day before. Uh, or if uh, you know the car sits outside waiting for you for 10 minutes before you're notified about it. That's completely useless. But if it happens at the right time, uh, then that notification is a great one for you. Uh, and same things for, you know, if you've just got sent a message, your car's here now, it's open for your, your check-in for your flight is open now. That was particularly useful for me as I like to try and get more legroom uh, in the seats. Um, but this also kind of deals with time itself. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this um, flowchart go around Twitter or the internet uh, in a while. This is apparently the decision tree and flowchart that Slack goes through uh, when deciding whether to send you a push notification. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, right? Like, who, you know, is it a mention? Is it a channel? Is it, um, is it within your do not disturb settings? All of that kind of stuff. Um, weirdly enough, of course, I can actually be sat on my laptop uh, looking directly at Slack and see a message come in, and my phone will still buzz uh, three seconds later to say that message arrived. Uh, so I think it actually looks a little bit more like this, is the, the flow chart. Like, woo! That's, come on, Phil. Somebody wants you. I know, I'm looking at it. Um, and, and so that, but that annoys me, right? And that's, that's the timeliness of that, of that message is, is in incorrect because I've already read the message, so getting another notification about it is wrong. Uh, and, and I've sent messages to support to get them to fix that, or at least remove this branch. <laughs> so these messages need to arrive in time and at the right time, uh, but also um, the right time of day. So it is important that they have this uh, huge flowchart to say, you know, do, um, do, do, does this person have do not disturb on right now? Should they be sleeping or at least not working? Um, that's important. Uh, in the right time zone as well. So time zones are about one of the most difficult things I think we, we end up dealing with as developers, uh, but very much important to, um, oh, depending on the importance of the message, uh, a, a Slack message or, uh, a, a, you know, at 4 a.m. is not something you want, but if your flight's at 6 a.m., you do still want the notification that your car's outside at 4 to pick you up to go there. And finally, the right number of notifications. Um, and so the web platform does actually allow you to um, not just... Uh, show off 30 notifications, but pick up and say you've got 30 new messages, which is much better uh, as a notification. Well, these messages are not just at the right time. Uh, that, that applies to the kind of the breaking news kind of story as well. Uh, but the thing about news uh, and other um, similar stories like that is that there's no action to be taken there, except maybe read the story. Uh, and, and some of these messages like make that obvious. Like You've got sent a message, you can read that message, respond to it. Uh, your car is here now, so leave the house. Um, you can check in now, so open the phone up and uh, get that exit row. Um, <laughs> it's important to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so taking an action as part of this notification is important as well. And then finally, personal, uh, because all of those notifications are, of course, about you, the person receiving the message, uh, receiving the, uh, the, the notification. Um, if, if, if it's about you, then you care about it. If it's about, and this again, the news, pop, news notifications just violate that entirely. That doesn't mean that people don't want those notifications, so it's always okay to, to make these available, but the best notifications, I think, are actionable, timely, and personal. So let's talk about how to push, the technical details of this. Because there's uh, quite a bit to uh, this. There's, uh, there's a number of moving parts. A bit of an overview. Uh, first up, you will have your user in their browser, uh, at which point you should ask them uh, permission to send push notifications. And we'll talk more about the permissions in a bit. Uh, but when you ask them permission, uh, the browser is going to give them back some uh, um, information. Well, we, we kind of register our service worker first, and then we can ask permission based on the service worker's installation. Uh, if the user says yes to that permission, then we get back uh, an object, um, which is kind of their subscription. Uh, to the push notification service. That subscription includes a number of things, including an endpoint and a couple of uh, encryption keys, which we should save for the user. So send it off to our own uh, database, our own server somewhere. Uh, then when we want to send a timely, actionable, and personal notification to that person, we can look in the database and get all that information out. Uh, we'll send, uh, we have an endpoint, and that's the URL which we'll uh, 
um, it depend actually defines the that user's existence in the browser's uh, push service, and uh, we then post the rest of the data to that. So the push service will then get in touch with the browser itself, uh, wake up the service worker, and trigger the push event in the worker. Uh, that then allows you in the worker to capture that event and show a notification to the user in the browser. So it kind of goes all the way around. Um, one thing that's a little bit complicated about this uh, is the Vapid uh, section. Uh, Vapid actually stands for Voluntary Application Server Identification for Web Push. Um, you can see where they got the, <laughs> it's not how you do acronyms, but <laughs> 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 they obviously wanted it to sound good. Um, uh, volunteer, but it, it does say what, it's, what, it, what it does. Like it identifies your server, your service uh, to the push services um, so that uh, if abuse or uh, if, you, if your service is overusing the push service, they can get in touch with you and kind of work it out rather than just cut you off. Um, Vapid uh, actually requires you to generate a public and private key uh, and, uh, and use that later. So uh, I'm more of a, a JavaScript developer. Uh, so if I was doing this in Node, I use the web push uh, npm package, um, which has a, a command line uh, tool to generate Vapid keys and gives you that public and private key. Um, if you are doing it in C Sharp, uh, the web push, uh, there's a web push library in C Sharp as well, which um, will generate you some Vapid keys. You only ever need to do this once, though, uh, which is nice, uh, because you then store that public and private key on your server and, uh, and look after them, particularly the private one, of course. And so what happens is you, you actually use that public key as part of the subscription and the permissions request uh, when asking for permission to push notifications with the user. Uh, and, the, um, and then when you send the push notifications, you then sign a, a JSON web token uh, using the private key. And so the, uh, the cloud service, the, the browser's push service, will then um, be able to verify uh, and identify your application as the one that originally signed up. Um, it is voluntary, but uh, this does allow you to include things like um, sending data with the push notification as well. So this is how it actually looks. We'll take that uh, Vapid key, the string that we got out there. We actually need to convert it to a, um, a byte array. Um, the, the Node Web Push uh, library uh, actually gives you an implementation of this URL base 64 to U8, uint 8 array. So you don't have to know what it does. You just have to know you use it. And once you've got that converted uh, Vapid key, uh, and you have a service worker registration. Uh, we can then use uh, kind of navigator service worker at ready uh, replies with that, that gives you a promise that will respond uh, or will fulfill with the uh, service worker whether it's already been installed or when it gets installed eventually. So we have that registration, uh, and on the registration we then call on its push manager service and ask to subscribe. We have these two keys. We've seen the second one, the application server key, which is uh, that. Uh, byte array of, uh, of the original Vapid key. And the second thing we have to tell it is user, vis user visible only is true. You can't set that to false, it will just, uh, it will reject that. Um, and this is just a it's, a, it's a hint to say, when you do send a push notification, you actually have to show something to the user. Because you could just be capturing those pushes and doing other stuff, downloading data, using the service worker in the background, and that's not what it's for right now. Uh, they are working, uh, the kind of the browsers are working on whether we should be able to do a silent push, uh, which in which just you can do some updating in the background. Uh, but for now, user visible only true is the only way to do this. Uh, if you do um, not show notifications when uh, when the browser when when you push them, uh, eventually, and I think it's around kind of eight to ten times you can do this quietly, and eventually the browser will start popping up notifications saying. This site is sending you a push, but not saying anything about it. Creepy. <laughs> Possibly with with less of that, but you know, uh, they do start to uh, to tell the user that this is happening in the background, and uh, and so there will be a visible notification even if you have no control over it. So we have to say that. Uh, then this what that asking to subscribe there will, if you haven't already got permission, pop up the permissions dialog for um, push notifications. If the user says yes, if they don't block it or dismiss it, uh, then we will get that subscription back. Uh, and uh, the subscription is the endpoint and the encryption keys that we can use later. Um, in this case, I'm just sending it down to the uh, to my server using the fetch API. Now, the subscription does come with a useful like to JSON uh, uh, method on it to turn it into a, just an object. That object looks a bit like this. 
so I got this one from Chrome. Uh, as you can see, we've got uh, fcm.googleapis.com there. So it's uh, Firebase Cloud Messenger uh, powering the push notifications for Chrome. Uh, Firefox's URL will look different to that. Uh, and um, what's quite nice about the Firefox one is that you can go and inspect the push service as well. It's, um, the code is hosted on GitHub. Uh, Mozilla are great. Uh, expiration time is not currently used, uh, but I believe it's just being included in case it does eventually become part of this. Uh, and then you have those two keys. Now I'm no encryption, encryption expert, which is why the rest of this will tend to show libraries of, of, of sending the push notifications, but somebody has already done the encryption for this, so we don't have to worry too much about it. So then on the server, uh, using the web push li library in Node, uh, you just set up your Vapid details, and this is where you have to set well, your public and private key that you generated originally, uh, but also uh, a, a subject, uh, and this can either be a URL to some kind of a contact page or a mail to, um, version which which just shows you just shows the service you know who they can contact uh, in terms of, of abuse of the of the push service and then web push you just kind of take the subscription which was that um, object that we saw earlier uh, and adds add the data that you want to send off as well I like to put it into JSON so that I can uh, destructure it later looks very similar using the C# -sharp web push library um, in this case you don't um, set it up with Vapid details uh, as, a, uh, as a global nature, just by, you just set them each time alongside a payload. And then when we receive it, uh, this is in the service worker file, uh, we're just gonna spend the time, uh, the service worker, all it does is listen for events. Uh, it doesn't spend time doing other stuff in the background, it just waits for events. Um, in this case, you get the event, and we can get the data out of the event that we sent. Um, and again, I because I like to, send it as JSON, we can then uh, parse it as JSON that way. Uh, event to wait until, if you've not seen this, uh, takes a promise as an argument, and we'll keep the service worker awake whilst that promise is, is still uh, being dealt with. And once it uh, fulfills or rejects, um, the event will give up, and uh, the service worker will be allowed to go back to sleep if it needs to. Uh, so in this case, um, the service worker's registration, you can then call show notification, and that will pop that notification up in the browser, or indeed not in the browser if you're on a mobile device. It doesn't have to even be open. Um, the show notification API is simply a, a, data, a, a title and then some other data. And so in this case, there's a body to the notification, but you can also send uh, images, a thumbnail, uh, and even for um, more advanced browsers, particularly, again, mobile, kind of Android, uh, Chrome, uh, you can send actions um, so that somebody can uh, choose to uh, kind of respond to the notification, not just by clicking it, but by clicking a specific button uh, inside, the inside the notification. Both of those, the Node and C-sharp libraries are maintained under the web push libs uh, GitHub organization. So, uh, uh, and there's other ones there as well if you need Python, Java. We can even C uh, is available there. Um, not the Ruby one, I also like Ruby, and uh, that one's done by somebody else, but most of them are under the web push libs here, so they can be trusted. I just wanted to show you a demo of this in, in action as well. Uh, I have uh, right here a little uh, application I, I've worked on for a little while. Uh, it's simply a, an SMS inbox and, and sending using the Twilio API. Uh, and um, what I've done is uh, I added some settings to it recently, including uh, to turn on push notifications. Uh, and so this is that flow for the user. Um, if they go to uh, if you want to ask permission for it, uh, then it's going to pop up this little box here saying uh, blocker allow. Uh, block and you'll never get to do this again. So you've got to behave. And again, I will talk about permissions in a minute. Uh, but I'm going to allow it for now. And that means that uh, I can actually close Chrome entirely. And if I get up um, quick time, this is my phone. It's come out weirdly, du weirdly dark. I don't know if that's something they broke in iOS 12, but I'm going to send uh, a message uh, to myself. Uh, to that number of mine. And what it should do is cause a push notification. Here we go. Nice. Uh, and uh, I can then click on that, and it's going to reopen up in my application. As you can see, there's me testing earlier as well. Um, but that was the, the message I just sent. Cool. So push notifications work, and they work quite well. But there is more to think about it, because as I keep coming to it, we need to talk about permissions. Permissions on the web uh, are being abused a little. If I can share a tweet that particularly struck me as a web developer, 
Um, this person, I believe they're actually in Sydney. I don't know who they are, though. I just like the tweet. It says, Dear website, I don't want you to post notifications to my desktop. I don't want to subscribe to your thing via a pop-up. I don't want you to know my location. I don't want you to order play that video. I'm angry and sad now. <laughs> web developers and web <laughs> applications these days are making users angry and sad. And I'm pretty sure that never goes on the board as something we want to do as part of our application. But we're causing it some of the time. I'm going to concentrate on permissions, but also, you know, don't autoplay video, please. Um, the browsers are getting in the way of that these days, which is nice. They don't know what to do about permissions yet, so we have to consider this. Because permissions have become a more, mo more important part of the web platform as it's gained all of these kind of abilities, uh, these abilities which, you know, are a bit more invasive or, or uh, important to privacy than regular kind of web application uh, stuff. So push notifications which can, you know, buzz you in your pocket, geolocation, so a site can know where you are, media devices, that's your camera, your microphone, um, Bluetooth, MIDI, Web USB, there's new sensors coming out. All of these things, um, you know, are, are more powerful than your regular web platform. And so we need to ask users permission to use this. Mm. However, um, if, for example, uh, you are visiting a website. This is Product Hunt. I like to pick on a few people. The first visit to ProductHunt.com, whether you know what they do or not, uh, they pop up one of these permissions dialogues to say, hey, Product Hunt would like to send you notifications. And you're like, who are you? I just got here. I don't know. They're not the only ones. They're just the ones I took video of. Um, if you want to get your tech news from CNET, uh, when, I, when I, I found them doing this, if you want to uh, learn how to build websites well, at SitePoint, not only do you get the push notification on page load, but also a full page modal asking you to sign up to their service, which you don't know what it is yet because it's supposed to look like this. And it's web development tutorials. They probably should be trying to espouse best practices rather than get in your face practices. And then there's even YouTube. This is not the first time I've visited YouTube. Uh, obviously, I'm in fact, I'm logged in, but uh, there's still popped up this permissions dialogue for me at one point asking for, for push notifications permissions. I hadn't clicked anything, I just loaded it. And it just came up with no context whatsoever. And this really is the problem with these permissions dialogues being popped up at, at users. They don't want it because there's no context. They don't know they want to want it. They, how could they? They just got there. Um, so as web developers, as people who care about user experiences, we need to stop. Because if we don't stop this, than the users are going to. And this is a site I found a while back um, when Googling how to stop websites showing notifications. And it has details on every single browser that supports notifications and how to turn them off. And I bet that's great for SEO, and I bet lots of people visit this, especially if they're angry and sad. Because, um, yeah. <laughs> All I want to say is just don't demand any permissions, not just push notifications, but any permissions on page load, uh, because users will want to turn them off. Uh, this is my worry that, uh, you know, permissions will actually become the new pop-ups. Um, and the, in those early days of the web, like, pop-ups became annoying, and then so annoying you just close them regardless of what was on them. Some people were using pop-ups for good things, possibly. Uh, but <laughs> possibly. There could have been useful stuff on there, but we didn't. eventually we didn't know because we just closed them. And then we got extensions, which would block pop-ups. And then the browsers blocked pop-ups. And that is going to happen to permissions uh, if, um, if we continue to abuse them in this way. Uh, and, you know, if, if users complain enough, perhaps the browsers will eventually remove the feature entirely. You see, when... The user reads that article on how to geek, on how to stop permissions being shown. Uh, they get sent to this Chrome settings page. And uh, it's actually buried in about three levels of navigation to get here. So they'll never find it again. <laughs> um, and they can choose in the middle there. They can choose to block like specific sites. Uh, in this case, I've blocked Facebook and Google Calendar. Um, but they won't, because there's this button at the top here, which allows you to block everything. And it's the same in Firefox. It's actually slightly less levels of navigation deep to get to this one. Um, block new requests to allow notifications. And what's nice is at least anybody that already has permission in this case can continue to have permission. It doesn't turn it off for everybody. 
It just means that nobody else can ever ask. No other website can ever say, with good reason or not, we would like to send you push notifications. So please, I think it's for the good of the web and for our users, do not demand permissions on page load. There are better ways to do this. There are better ways to get these permissions. We already saw, I had in my uh, little example um, back here, my settings page. Uh, I could probably word that better. Turn on push notifications is not the most obvious. To receive incoming messages would be the, uh, the best way to name that. Um, but uh, and, you know, that would, I would have to still point that out to a user that they could use it. But just kind of waiting until the user has all the right context for a notification is best. And this is, uh, in my opinion, been best shown by uh, this application built by, uh, it's an example application, but it was built by Matt Gaunt on the Chrome uh, Develop, Developer Relations team. And it's just a fake airline. And once you've purchased your ticket, in this case from uh, Las Vegas to San Francisco and back, um, at that point, and only at that point, does he show this little banner at the bottom, get notifications for flight delays. And I, that's great. You've just booked a ticket. Uh, you know you're going to get on a plane by this company. Uh, but if that plane happens to turn up late, you'd probably like to know about it. At this point, you check that little box, and that's when he invokes the permissions dialogue. And at that point, you're like, I know exactly why you're going to send me notifications. Brilliant. I will take that. Thank you very much. Of course, if Polymer Airways later then sends you a notification about a sale, you can cancel it all, kill it, turn it all off. Um, <laughs> because that, that's an abuse of that trust. But if all they do is send you alerts about uh, delays, then this is going to be a great user experience. I mentioned chat earlier as kind of a very obvious use case for push notifications. And so if you've seen Slack in the, uh, in the browser, you will have seen, actually, I think they've changed the color to blue now, and then later red, uh, saying Slack needs permissions to use your uh, uh, push notifications on the desktop. Uh, and the best thing about this is it has a little cross in the top right-hand corner uh, so you can dismiss this request for permissions. And these days they say, we really need this, are you sure? And you can go, yes, I never want to see this again. But all you do there is you never see that banner across the top again. You do not see, um, you do not see that page in Chrome that allows you to block everything. Uh, you do not see that page in Firefox that allows you to block everything. You just stop them showing the banner across the top. I think that's a nice, uh, nice thing for, for very obvious uh, use cases. And finally, there should be a way to opt out of push notifications within the application. Again, what we want to do is never drive the user to the settings page that makes them block notifications. Uh, this is Twitter's iOS application, which I think is a pretty good example of this, um, mainly because I never want to get a push notification about news from Twitter. Um, but I could go turn that off but still get mentions and direct messages. And so if you have a range of push notifications in your application, you should always have a settings panel to allow people to turn them all off, turn some of them off. Again, just to never, ever push them to that alternative, which is blocking everything. <sighs> so use push notifications for good. There are very good reasons for them to exist. Um, and I think I've explained some of them. And, and clearly, with the hands up at the start, some people do agree that we should have them. Um, as developers, we should use them for good and, and decide whether this is an experience we want to give our users. So let's talk about background sync. Background sync is slightly newer than push notifications. Uh, but it does deal with that kind of online offline scenario, uh, that, um, that the caching kind of stuff that works for, for, for the service worker uh, deals with. So if caches are for get requests, and we can respond with HTML that we have cached, or indeed that we could just uh, make up and give back, uh, then background sync is for those post requests, for any kind of form submission. Um, because it's not too useful. Um, it's, it's perfectly useful if you get a page of HTML back when you try and visit something offline. And it might say, sorry, you're offline, or here's, a, here's something that we have for you, but you can't have the thing you, have, you want right now. But if you're trying to send a message, if you're trying to post a comment, or add something to a shopping cart, or like, or favorite something, all of these little activities that make something happen, it really is, like the dinosaur is not a good answer for that, because not only um, not only do you, do you not have the site you were looking at, but also you've probably lost all the stuff you put into that field, um, and it's, it's just a terrible experience. And we can't just return a cached value either, 
because that's got nothing to do with the data that we were trying to send. So how do we how do we improve that experience? And how do we take it such that if a user performs a request whilst they're without signal or without a connection, how can we make that happen again when that signal comes back? And I think this is a this is a good way of describing the background sync API because I think background sync makes it sound like it does more than perhaps uh, it do, it should. Background sync to me makes it sound like it can do it can kind of periodically or, or every once in a while like uh, make a sync in the background. Or it's not about that. It's about coming back online. Uh, it, it's more of a back online API uh, that allows you to perform a task. Uh, now you have connection again. Browser support is not quite as good as push notifications. Uh, it is available in Chrome and it's available in Opera, but not Firefox or Safari or Edge. But if we actually take those away, and particularly if we consider the mobile aspect, um, it is available in Chrome and Opera, and also uh, Samsung's internet browser and UC browser, a couple of the other bigger kind of still Chrome-based Android browsers out there. But when you add all, all of these together, um, can I use this global stats again? Tells me that 67, nearly 68% of people have access to the background sync API. That's two thirds of your users. And again, put your own stats in there to find out whether that's true for your users. But, uh, but globally, about two thirds of people can use this background sync API. So again, certainly not worth uh, uh, ignoring. Is anybody a fan of IndexedDB in the front end? Two people, wow, three, four. Oh, you actually like IndexedDB, this is great. Um, because uh, a lot of people don't, because it's a horrible API, right? <laughs> Sorry. However, uh, it's the only storage API we can use in the service worker. The service workers do not uh, like any synchronous APIs at all. You can't look at cookies, you can't look at local storage. And so our only asynchronous storage API is IndexedDB. So if you don't like it, and that was most of the people in the room, uh, and you want to use something like background sync, you might, you might have to get to like it. So the plan basically here is, we have a user who's gone offline for some reason, and their request fails due to the network's gone down. Um, we want to save that request data into IndexedDB. Uh, however you want to. Um, we can do this on the, on the page itself and or in the service worker as a response to a, a post fetch event. If we save that request data in IndexedDB, we then register uh, for a sync. Uh, what we want is the user to come back online and then uh, have a sync event fire, and then we can play that request again. Um, and this is how that works. Uh, in this particular case, this is on the, on the page, the user trying to do something. Uh, I've, I've wrapped it up as a fetch request uh, using the fetch API. And if that goes wrong, if, we, if, if there's an error for some reason, uh, you probably would check whether this is a, a timeout or, oh no, that's not right, no. Fetch will respond with a success, even if it's a 404 or a, uh, it's a successful request. Um, it just might have an error code on it. Uh, so if a fetch fails, we can catch that and then do something about it. So again, I'm using uh, the, ready fun uh, the ready property on the service worker that's gonna return that promise that returns the service worker registration when we're ready for it. And um, I don't know what data you might have, but we're gonna save that into IndexedDB. And the important thing in this whole thing is uh, that we call on the registration using the sync manager object. Uh, we just register, uh, and we pass a string there. That's just a tag for this particular sync event that we want to, uh, to, to use. So this will, the event that eventually gets fired uh, will have the tag fail in this case. And so on the service worker, this is where uh, we deal with that. Um, we just listen for the sync event, which will fire when the browser reconnects. Uh, we then need to reach into our IndexedDB database, get all the stuff out, and again, like I said, we now have to do this definitely asynchronously, um, probably with a promise, because service workers really like promises as well, so look into um, the promise-based libraries like Dexy or uh, IDB, which uh, wrap IndexedDB in a nice promise kind of uh, language, uh, and, then, and then send that data back off again. And we can do more here, we can catch if that fails again, if the user happens to have gone online and offline, um, we can keep the data in the, in the, in the database and, uh, and try again another time, uh, register for the sync event again if we need to. Um, what's nice about this, if it does fail a number of times, eventually uh, 
and, and perhaps it's not due to a network condition, but some other failure, uh, background sync will only actually try uh, a number of times, and it will. The event here will include a um, the event here will include a property uh, last time, I think, or last try, when uh, which will be true on its last attempt. Uh, I think it's last attempt, in fact. Uh, on that last attempt, it will tell you, "I'm not going to try this again." Uh, it does try to back off uh, over the over the course of doing this as well. Let's show a demo of that um, because I think that one's uh, quite cool to see. Oops, out of here. So in this case, I'm actually going to go to send messages. So first, I'm going to Dropbox. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn the Wi-Fi off. Uh, no, I'm going to turn it back on. Hold on. I'm going to show you this works um, before and how it works before, and then um, afterwards. So we're currently on the Wi-Fi. So I can send myself a message saying hello from online. And that's going to send, and go through the internet, and arrive at my phone. There. Cool. So I'm going to turn the Wi-Fi off. So definitely no connection. And uh, I'm going to do this from the online version. Um, send myself a message saying hello from offline. And what you might notice at this point is that that actually disappears a lot quicker. Um, this is because there's definitely no network connection, and uh, and so the fetch um, the AJAX request failed uh, much quicker than it succeeded in the first version. And what we can do is open up DevTools and uh, check into the IndexedDB tools here, and we can see uh, this is that message I was trying to send myself, hello from offline. So I've gone and stored it in, the, in IndexedDB uh, rather than sending it anywhere. Now, uh, if I turn, the, uh, turn that back on, uh, we'll reconnect to the network. Uh, the browser will trigger the sync event. Uh, it will then get the data out of the index DB, send it down to the server, and then send the message, go through the Twilio API, and then comes my phone. There it is. It was quicker than I could explain it. Um, it looks like it's still in index DB, but that's because we haven't refreshed yet, and so the data's been cleared out of there as well. That is how background sync should work and, and make our experiences much better. Um, with using forms online. I haven't mentioned many libraries for the front end yet and how to use service workers, uh, but at this point it's really, uh, I think it's important to call out one, uh, which is Workbox. Uh, Workbox is uh, built and maintained by, again, the Chrome Dev Developer Relations team uh, as a, a multitude of uh, useful uh, service worker kind of things. And it has a load of strategies uh, just available to you, well-tested and well-understood strategies for caching uh, data offline. What it also allows you to do is build a uh, almost declarative uh, background sync version as well. And so in this case, you can include the Workbox background sync plugin uh, with a with a queue name. They've called it a queue here, but uh, in reality, in the API, it's a tag. Um, I, I nabbed this from the documentation, so that's why I'm calling it they, they did. And you can also set a max retention time, right? So if you don't want to send that message, in this case, you know, later than 24 hours later, um, you and you can set that to whatever you want. And then you just register a route. Uh, in this case, the example is that anything that's under API uh, slash something dot JSON, um, the workbox will get in the way. It will send it through if the network's available. And if it's not available, it uses that background sync plugin to retry anything up to, in this case, 24 hours later. Uh, only for post requests, as it's got there at the bottom. Uh, and this is just a great uh, way to, um, and, and so in this case, the service worker is doing both the storing of the data uh, into IndexedDB and getting it back out all within the service worker, rather than uh, in my original example, which does it in the page itself. Uh, and it does it in this kind of real, yeah, declarative and nice way. So Workbox uh, is really useful. It doesn't seem to do anything for push notifications, uh, but all you need to do in push notifications is re respond to that push event, and you're kind of done. So background sync can be used to enhance uh, forms. I think I use the word enhance in for most of the things I talk about with service workers, normally because uh, you know there's still browsers out there that do not support service workers. There's still browsers that don't support background sync. But if we build this as an enhancement, uh, especially if we put all of that logic uh, as Workbox has done here, into the service worker itself, 
then uh, as soon as browsers gain that capability, then uh, the users will, they won't notice that it's been upgraded, but suddenly they're gonna have better experiences uh, regardless of their network connections. I wanna finish with one experimental API. Uh, this is one you can't and shouldn't use yet, but uh, if you like to experiment with these things, it might be worth a look. Um, it has a smaller use case, uh, and it's the background fetch API. Background fetch is for effectively uh, kind of controlling the browser's downloads uh, section and, and being able to hook into events based on it. Um, the idea is if you have a large file to download or a m number of large files or even a number of large number of small files, you don't want to have to keep the user on your page, not kind of navigating about the site whilst this happens. Uh, and so if you have that, you can use the background fetch API. Uh, it's very similar to how we use the sync and the push manager. Uh, we just get a, we get the service worker registration and it's background fetch manager. And we call fetch and we pass a list of URLs. And we can give it some in information like icons uh, and a, a download size hint in order to give the browser's UI a bit of a, uh, uh, information that it might be able to use. And then in the service worker, we can respond to the success of those files being downloaded. And uh, in this case, in this example, just update the UI. But also, what you would really do is put them into the cache, into that service worker cache, so that the next time a user visits that uh, page or uh, you know, wants to do whatever they, they had um, involved in the, with those large files, uh, they're ready for them uh, in their browser already. This kind of thing is useful, in my opinion, for audio video if you're building a podcast player on, on a, in the browser, um, you can be pushing, if you've got a push notification to say, hey, there's a new episode, you'll say kick off a background fetch of that episode right there in the service worker, and you can then notify the person, you say this episode is also now downloaded and ready for you to listen to. Uh, no stuttering, no worries. You just stream it straight from, uh, straight from the cache. Same for video. Uh, but I also see this as important uh, as we start to build more games on the, on the web. Uh, and as, as we start to build larger game engines into it, and that brings me to kind of WebAssembly. If we, uh, uh, some of the best examples of WebAssembly have been kind of packaging up Unity and putting it on the web. Uh, but that's quite a download. However, if the browser can be doing it in the background whilst you're off doing something else and notify you when that game is now ready, that's a better experience. The problem with uh, background fetch is, uh, as I said, it is experimental. Uh, I did just, uh, I, I have written a test of it myself, uh, which used to work and now doesn't. And that's all in Canary, so none of this has ever reached a, a user-capable browser yet. Uh, but it's worth keeping an eye on, and I, I kept it in this talk because uh, checking this morning um, on the uh, GitHub uh, proposal pe uh, repo for background fetch, uh, there was actually uh, activity on it five days ago. So it looks like the browsers, or at least Chrome in this case, is moving on, uh, on implementation and fixing this up again, because they seem to, right, they, the, the, the spec itself is, is being worked on. So this is something that might be coming again soon, uh, worth keeping an eye out for. So in conclusion, um, the service worker is, again, my favorite <laughs> uh, API, uh, and, uh, and it's super important for um, building ourselves uh, resilient, performant experiences that work online or offline, and are not just features. Push notifications is not a feature. Uh, it's just a technology. Background sync is a technology, uh, but it allows us to build better features for our users as part of their experience for the application. If that's something we want to do, if that's something uh, that is important to us as developers, then the service worker is there to help us achieve that and build better applications. Um, that's all I've got for you this afternoon. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, there were some icons there. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, like, do um, uh, come up and say hi to us at the Twilio booth. We're also uh, playing around with Twilio Quest, which is a, a fun way to kind of learn uh, Twilio. And if you take part in the first mission, you will get a T-shirt sent to you. So come and check that out as well. Other than that, I think we might, I don't know what the time is. Um, we probably have 10 minutes for questions if, uh, if anybody has any questions. We have a question. Yes, cool. Oh, 
so I, uh, as a developer evangelist, I don't work on core parts of Twilio myself. Um, and if I did, I'd be telling people to do this. Uh, we have a notifications API, which does support iOS, Android, and web notifications. So we do make it available uh, as part of that. Um, but uh, sadly, I haven't convinced anybody on the website to implement anything yet. <laughs> Um, I'd like to see more of it, uh, but um, they're all in San Francisco and I'm here, so they, they just ignore me in Slack. <laughs> Um, so the service worker itself, um, and this is my current theory on this, is that the service worker is, is, is that step out of what we understand web programming, web development to be. Or that JavaScript is on the page and it's running. Um, and so adding this extra thing makes it harder to test, harder to reason about your application in the same way as you're always used to. Uh, and and especially kind of those initial uh, kind of service worker caching things, um, it's very easy to say my users are always online. I, like for um, a, a person using Twilio, for example, if they're on our website, if they're on twilio.com uh, and they, they're trying to send an API request and looking at our documentation or something like that, if they're not online, that's why the documentation is failing and that's why their API requests are failing. So I think within Twilio, for example, we wouldn't necessarily consider offline as, a, as an important use case for the website. However, this is why I'm trying to reframe it. It's not just uh, a use case and not just a feature, but it's about improving that experience. Now, that still means that uh, uh, it depends on how much you can then sell the experience to whoever is uh, lining up the sprint this, this time around or whatever, uh, and, and to work on it in that respect, um, which I agree is, is quite hard, um, <laughs> especially with, when it's something that's new and less understood. Uh, this is why I, I try and talk about this, because I want to see more of it in the world, uh, and I, I hope that um, features like this can give you more ammuni ammunition to uh, then build those experiences yourself. Um, that's, that's why we're doing it. Like None of, none of, this, um, none of this happens unless uh, we go out of this room today and, uh, and try and build something new tomorrow. Any other questions at all? Yeah, I go from back. This is uh, actually something that I have been trying to get them to change. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the browsers should uh, not allow a permissions request to pop up until there's been some kind of user interaction with the page. That is similar to pop-ups these days. Like if you click on a link and within uh, the, the, the click event of that link, you can use window.open to open a pop-up. That's allowed because that's a, an expected behavior when you click on a link. We're either going to go somewhere new or pop something up. Um, and I want the same for, for buttons and things like that. There is currently an argument against that, uh, which I don't believe in. Uh, the argument is that um, there are a couple of companies out there that uh, whilst trying to help uh, implement people implement uh, push notifications on their sites, uh, because the service worker and thus push notifications require um, HTTPS as the site, for people that haven't managed to move to that yet, uh, these companies have offered them a solution where uh, a user clicks, it redirects to their site, and that pops up the push notification. So technically, they've given the context already, and that's why they moved to this other site. However, um, the internet should all be moving to HTTPS. I don't think that's a, that's a strong argument for the future. And so hopefully, this will um, be resolved eventually with, with something like, uh, uh, yeah, just no permissions pop ups until a, an interaction or at least some kind of heuristic on uh, on whether the user has used or understood this website yet um, that's the kind of thing that that browsers were using to uh, work out whether they should be offered uh, work out whether a user should be offered to add this to a home screen for example uh, they have these heuristics to say whether there's been engagement with the site whether, whether the user is likely to come back to it uh, and so something along those lines is, is something I'd like to see um, the web, uh, the WICG, which I 
always forget what WICG actually means, uh, but that committee has a, a, a repo on GitHub uh, called Interventions. So it's github.com slash WICG slash interventions. And I, it's a really interesting place because their interventions are how can we break existing things on the web to make it better for everyone? Normally, browsers like hate to break the web, right? Because if a browser updates and a site stops working, users and web developers get annoyed about that. This interventions repo is discussions about can we break the web that we have built so far that's going to create a better experience in the future? And uh, this argument over the permissions pop-ups is one of those interventions. So hopefully, we can, uh, we can just stop people being able to do it at some point. Um, but we can't yet, and we, that's, why I'm, that's why there are better patterns, but that's, that's all we have right now. No problem. Uh, so the implementation from the browser in background sync itself is as dumb as you know you have to you get you um, register for the event you get the event so everything else is up to your own application's code um, so uh, I just remember that there's there's a four letter does anybody else know this what, what the um, kind of algorithms that things like Google Docs use for particularly when multiple people are using and changing you kind of you store the changes rather than the whole state, and that way you can merge things in or decide there's a conflict, kind of a little like version control as well. Like this CRDT, that's the one. Uh, look up CRDT as, uh, as a way to kind of um, deal with that. Uh, and it depends on what your application uh, does, right? Um, in my simple messaging example, that's me doing it one time. Um, but you're right, if there's, a, if there's a collaboration going on, or even uh, if the person is likely to go and try again later from another browser or from somewhere else. Um, it's it's application by application kind of basis. No worries. Anybody else at all? No? All right, well, thank you very much again. My name is Von Ash. Uh, I'm a developer manager at Twilio. Thank you so much.